Once upon a time, there were three little pigs. They were wondering what would be the best thing with which to build their house. One felt that he was interested in economy and local production and thought it would be a useful idea to make his house of straw. The other one thought that, there, that it would be better to build his house of planks because they are more substantial. The other one felt that the additional effort of putting some bricks and mortar together would pay off in the long run. The three little pigs did their research because they had a practical problem in the form of a big bad wolf who threatened to huff, puff and blow their house down. My name is Johannes Kronier. I've been a professor of computers and education for the past hundreds of years, longer than I can think of counting. And in the process, I've supervised masters and doctoral students, and I stopped counting at about 60. But what I've discovered is that, really, it's not such a fuss. There are easier ways and shortcuts and easier ways of doing things. And I thought I'd put some of those together and share that with you, because if we can take a nursery rhyme as a concept for a thesis, then that might be a rather good idea. So I'm going to talk to you today about how to write a research proposal. And we're going to use the standard research proposal format that begins with an introduction, a literature review, methodology, preliminary data, statement of limitations, conclusions, and that's about what we're going to do. But we never start with an introduction, because an introduction means this is where we, I am going with this research of mine or with this proposal of mine. So you won't know where you're going unless you've been there. So we write the introduction last. People often ask me, how do you start your research? Where, what should you do your research about? What one has to remember about research is that it is just that. It is research. You do some research after you have searched. And you will be searching the literature. Now before you start searching the literature and reading, you must do just that. Search. And where do you start your search? Please don't tell anybody that I told you this, but you start your research with Wikipedia. Because that's where the people who actually know what the thing works like actually do their work. But there's a little trick about Wikipedia. You don't read the front page of Wikipedia. Go to the little tab over here. And when you've seen the little tab, you get to the back of Wikipedia. And that's where the experts who are doing the writing chat to each other. And that's where you want to scratch around. You also want to go down to the bottom of Wikipedia where the references are to other works. And that's what you want to look at. So you would never, in masters or doctoral studies, refer to Wikipedia as such. But you would, you would refer to those things that Wikipedia refers to. Remember, you didn't hear that from me. So in your literature review, the purpose of the, that literature review is to find the gap in which you can research. Remember, you're trying to solve an intellectual puzzle. You're not trying to solve a, a physical puzzle. And we'll talk about that a little bit later when we talk about research problems, once you get to that research problem. You're going to look for somewhere in the literature that, it's, that it says to you, we don't know about X. One of the good things to do is to go through, your, to find out who are the heroes in the field. And once you know the heroes in the field, find out what are those heroes saying. And how do you do that? You look for people with the highest H score. And the H score you will find on their Google. You could use something like Housing's Publish or Perish, which is a little piece of software into which you type people's names and it'll tell you what your H score is. Your H score is about your reputation. It tells you how many publications of yours has been cited how many times. And the higher your H score, the more credible a researcher you are. So what you're trying to do before you even start reading is making sure that you read the people who are worth reading. It's the most terrible thing if a doctoral thesis comes back from an external examiner and the examiner says, this person wouldn't even have done this research had they only read the article by X, who is the most famous person in the field. And you missed that person. So you need to know who your heroes are. And once you've unpacked your heroes, you take just the abstracts of what they've written. You're not reading yet. You're just taking the abstracts. So you take all the abstracts 
and you cut and paste those abstracts together into one large Word document and you dump all those into a website called Wordle. And Wordle will draw you a word cloud from which you will see what are the key words that emerge. Those key words you would then put into databases. Information specialists will help you with and you will know what keywords to put in that. And then you can start the literature survey from there. The literature survey has three bits. There's the literature on the topic, the literature on the method, and the literature on the theoretical approach. The literature on the topic is a research project on its own, and you should actually be able to publish that. We usually call that a meta-analysis. That's when you look at all the other analyses that other people have done and you analyze that. The format of your literature survey will be the same as any other piece of research. You will have an introduction, you will have some reason telling us why you're doing this literature survey. In other words, a tiny little piece saying, who said that why I should be doing this type of literature survey? Then a statement of the methodology. How did you source your articles? How did you make sure that they are the right ones? How did you ensure their credibility? How did you ensure their reliability? How did you decide which articles you're going to include and which articles you are going to exclude? And then you'll give us an overview of the field. If I look at the field, these are the big aspects that people are considering. These are the things that matter. And then you go into the one that you're interested in. And then you say, there are people who say X, and there are people who say Y, <clears throat> but somehow there's no agreement about this, which leads us to question the following. And so every piece of the literature survey leads to your research question. And you can either work on a debate, so people say A and people say B, but we don't know Z, and therefore the question is, what is Z? Or you can work in a tradition, which says people have said this, and then they've innovated there, and then they've innovated there, and now we don't know what next, and so that's why I'm going to do my research. There are, those are the two ways in which one does it. The important thing about a literature survey, however, and that distinguishes it from an undergraduate literature survey. In an undergraduate literature survey, you must tell us what we know from the literature. In a postgraduate li literature survey, you must tell us what we don't know from the literature. And how do we know that? It's because the authors who know everything tell us that that is what we don't know. The same goes for the second part of the literature survey, which is the literature on method. And in the literature on method, you will say, why are some methods being used? Why are other methods not being used? What are the advantages and disadvantages? And why, therefore, should you be doing the one that you are doing? Again, you're not going to tell us what the methods are and why they are there. You're going to assume that your external examiner is a professor in the field and already knows those methods and their advantages and disadvantages. We are interested in why they are advantages and disadvantages for you. And we'll talk more about that when we talk about the methodology. And the last bit that you do is the theoretical approach, where you say to yourself, so when I do this research, this is what I believe. Because you see, the purpose of theory is that theory predicts. So the theory will tell us already that straw is likely to be blown over. The theory tells us that bricks are likely to be robust. So the next item that we cover would be the research methodology. Now I like to use the word research method rather than methodology because methodology is really the study of method. And if you're going to write a proposal, I'm not interested in the study of method. I'm interested in what is the method that you're going to use. Fixed design would be something like an experimental design. The three little pigs did exactly that, a controlled experiment. They built the house of, of straw. They invited the big bad wolf over. He huffed and puffed. He blew the little house down. Some people say he ate the little pig in the house. The other ones say the little pig actually managed to escape. And these are all parts of the ethics considerations, you know. Um, and then they the, the house was built of planks, and there was huffing and puffing, and again, there was uh, empirical evidence that planks are not a good way of building a house, and then there was the run all the way 
to the, the uh, house built of bricks. So you can see this was a fixed experimental design. <clears throat> On the other hand, there can be flexible experimental designs where the three little pigs could have asked one another what problems they would envisage had they built the houses of those various topics. So that's what we mean by, by research design, whether you're going to follow a fixed or a flexible design. The research procedures are what you are actually going to do. I am going to collect some straw, I'm going com to compile that straw, I'm going to pack that straw on top of each other, I'm going to invite a wolf, I'm going to ask him to blow, and I'm going to measure the amount of time it takes until that happens. Then we need to look at the data that we obtain. So, the next thing we look at then is the research procedures. And this is where people sometimes get it wrong. Where you're, for instance, going to use a questionnaire. And people then start by writing saying, a questionnaire is a set of questions that can be... I know what a questionnaire is. Tell me first what you are going to do, then tell me why you're going to do it, and then tell me which author says that you should be doing that. Tell me, I'm going to use a questionnaire because I want to distribute it a lot, um, to a very large target population because I need a lot of data so that I can make a high level of statistical precision. Or tell me that I want to do interviews because I want to come close to what people are saying. And they're not going to be structured interviews. They're going to be unstructured interviews so that the interviewee can follow the process. And then tell me who the person is who says that that will work. So generally, when we talk about data and the type of data that we get, people will tell us you get quantitative data, which is with numbers, and qualitative data, which is with stories. I don't like the wordplay quantitative, qualitative, also because sometimes it makes one sort of feel that there's no quality in quantitative data. So the words don't do it for me. David Plowright uses another distinction. He talks about narrative and numeric data, and I like that. But since your external examiner may not know the difference, it might be a good idea to upfront to say, I'm going to use narrative or qualitative data, or say, I'm going to use numeric or quantitative data, and then carry on. But it's more important for me to know what is the data. Don't, I don't care whether it's quantitative or qualitative. I want to know what it is that you're going to do. Then you're going to talk about collection procedures. How are you actually going to collect the data? How are you going to um, select participants? Um, and once you've selected your participants, how are you going to address them to get this data? Are you going to do interviews? Um, are you going to do a structured sampling? Are you going to do convenience sampling? Are you going to do a snowball sampling? We want to know what sort of sampling you're going to do. And then we want to know how you're going to get your subjects. Who are you going to ask? Are, you going to, are, they, are they participants that you know? Are you going to select them at random? We want to know those sort of things. And again, the rhythm is, I am going to do this because I want to achieve that as is said by this person. And then you need to look, if you're going to use human subjects, you need to remember that there are all sorts of criteria that your institution will need. You may have letters of permission, you may have letters of consent, and various other things. And then also you need to have a look at your ethics statement. Where people get it wrong is when they say, I will obtain ethical clearance from the university. So I want to know, what are the risks that you're going to be subjecting your participants to, and how are you going to mitigate those risks? And you need to show that you have thought through those processes very clearly. It will also be very useful if you refer to some authors who can verify the ethical correctness of various things that you will be doing. And then finally, you also need to say, what do you expect all this to cost, and where do you think the money is going to come from?